Now, Doc, June is Bowel Cancer Month. Uh, so, let's try to understand more about this condition. Uh, there are more hospitals and cleaning, clinics testing for COVID-19 right now, more so than bowel cancer. So, what are some of the signs and symptoms of bowel cancer? Yeah, I think... Uh... So oh, it's one of the commonest cancers, you know, breast, lung, and then bowel. These are the three main common cancers. Really? And, yeah. And I think, uh, especially for men, I think the second after lung disease is the second largest cancer. So uh, with all this COVID thing going on, I think a lot of people have stopped doing a lot of tests that are, you know, for other diseases. And I think one of them affected is bowel cancer. Uh, now, the simple test we normally do is a stool uh, occult blood. That means looking for blood in the stools. And uh, if there's blood in the stools, then it's a very early sign of uh, or one of the signs of bowel cancer. And then uh, the doctors will then call you in and then get a scope done to see whether there's really some growth there or is something else causing that blood in the stools. So all this because of COVID has actually been postponed. A lot of elective sort of uh, scopes are not done routinely now. So I think that's one of the things that uh, we are worried about, you know, because uh, best Bowel cancer, detected early, treated early, very good prognosis. Mm. Delayed treatment and, you know, the, if it spreads, go to stage three or four, then the prognosis becomes more serious. You know, the risk of mortality is higher. So, stage one, stage two, very good uh, chance of recovery. So, we want to detect this cancer early. Is that the only symptom, Doc? Uh, blood in the stool? That's the earliest common symptom. I mean, later, of course, you can have things like uh, pain, you know, lower abdominal pain or pain when you pass uh, moisture. But that's already an uh, early sign. Or, you know, people even get problems with, uh, if the growth has not been detected. They yeah. can come with a problem with constipation, you know, suddenly not able to pass tools and all that. Uh, but but so it's one or the other. You could go too much or not go at all. Yeah, that's right. So that, but that, by then, you're actually talking of uh, something that's more delayed already. So we wanted to detect where you've got early symptoms where you just pick up blood in the stool. That means this is a screening test. We actually do a screening test to see it for that. Because now, tell tell people... yeah. now, doctor, tell us about the complications of being diagnosed with bowel cancer. Again, if detected early, you know, the doctors pick up early, uh, you know, surgery in the early stage will probably see you know, sort of cure that cancer. But any delay... Can have all these complications, pain, you know, constipation, block, bowel obstruction. Of course, the cancer can spread, and then you get all the other symptoms of, uh, you know, cancer that is, you know, stage three and stage four. Uh, so uh, that can be many things, you know, weight loss, uh, tiredness, lethargy, poor appetite. Of course, ultimately you worry about uh, the cancer itself causing the death. So uh, we want to pick it up early. So. The earlier we pick up, the less the complications, less the risk of uh, disease spreading. So, so essentially, uh, bowel cancer is a growth in the large intestine? Normally, it's in the rectum. That's a commonest place. But it can be anywhere in the colon. It's a large intestine. So the rectum, the you know, descending and ascending colon. So, uh, but the commonest one is in the rectum. And like all other cancers, it is um, a, a growth, an abnormal growth in anywhere in, right. the, in the colon. In the intestine, yeah. Sometimes it starts off with a polyp, you know, then that, that polyp is uh, pre-cancerous, then it becomes cancerous. So sometimes doctors recommend that after 50, you should go for colonoscopes, uh, especially if you've got a strong family history, then you should go for screening and uh, scopes. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if any symptoms, you should go and get it checked out. Mm -mm -mm. So what are some of the treatment options available for bowel cancer? Is it the same as all other cancers? Yeah, I, I mean, in bowel cancer, if early detection uh, surgery is the best. You know, you can, stage one, you can actually cure it. Then, of course, depending on the stage, they can look at uh, radiotherapy, they look at chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. A lot of the new therapies are the immunotherapy. So depending on where they pick it up, uh, the different therapies will be there. Hopefully, if you pick it up early, surgery will sort of almost cure that cancer from spreading and all the safe. And if you don't catch it early, what what is the worst case scenario? I mean, I mean once you, any cancer spreads, then your risk of uh, dying prematurely are definitely very high. You know, that, that goes for any cancer, stage three or four, 
uh, treatment normally doesn't do as well as stage one or two. Yeah, but if people don't notice blood in their stools, right? It's sometimes you don't don't go and look at your stools after you've done you your. You just want to flush it away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's no so other pain or that. like. If you have diarrhea constantly, is that... Uh... Does it feel like gastric? Sometimes you get the symptoms like uh, alternating diarrhea and uh, constipation. Mm. They suddenly get loose stools and then uh, then they go away. Then you suddenly get constipated. So they call alternating diarrhea constipation can be one of the symptoms. Of course, uh, weight loss can be another symptom. But all these are looking at not early detection. Really. These mm. are already looking at uh, this cancer is already spreading. Mm. So that's why it's, it's a screening if you have risk factors and if you suspect, uh, you know, you, it's uh, go and get just a simple stool or cold blood, like they, they look at that. So All the right. flip side of this, Doc, is let's say something like IBS or if you're constipated constantly at a young age, does that cause bubble cancer? No. I think we still don't know a lot of the causes of cancer, but IBS doesn't normally uh, cause cancer. And uh, uh, constipation per se shouldn't, but again, things like you know, low fiber diets, uh, uh, all these are actually risk factors for cancer. Uh, so, again, back to your lifestyle, a lot of uh, foods that are refined, a lot of toxic food, they say, or good bacteria are reduced for because of all the bad uh, diet habits we have. So, all that increases the risk of cancer. Also, a high fiber diet actually protects you. So, again, back to that, you know, uh, high vegetable fruit diet. High fiber diet will help. Healthy eating. All right. Let's move on to our next article. And this one is, uh, it's not easy to pronounce. I'll try. <laughs> um, this one is about hemochromatosis. Uh, so, doctor, okay. what is it and how, why does it occur? Basically, it's a condition of, a, uh, you know, hereditary. That means you, you, you inherit from your parents and it's a genetic condition where your body absorbs too much of iron and deposits iron in different organs, you know, especially the liver, spleen and uh, your pancreas. And uh, this can of course cause damage to those organs and uh, iron overload, basically you have a lot of iron in the body. Mm. And uh, so uh, damage to the organs will occur uh, and, uh, you know, you get a lot of uh, symptoms like, uh, again, things like constipation, weight loss, loss of appetite. And so too much iron in the body can be actually dangerous. Uh, you know, people get liver failure. So it's a genetic condition. Normally our body can manage how much iron you need to store and how much to excrete, how much to absorb. So here they have boost, boost that ability. And uh, uh, so it's actually a hereditary genetic condition that uh, people have. Is it possible that uh, we can take too much iron? to cause uh, hemochromatosis? Unless you're overdosing yourself, you know, but uh, normally you wouldn't come, come to the condition where you get such severe iron deposits. Your body can help to manage and you know, absorb what it wants. Actually. Even if you take a lot, your body can adjust itself. Uh, I mean, iron is important for forming hemoglobin and all, but uh, too much iron, the body then can't, uh, you know, excrete it and then it starts depositing in organs. So, and that's when you get damage of organs. Uh, so, liver damage will cause all liver problems. Pancreas can lead to diabetes. So, this is what you want to avoid. And uh, the only good thing about uh, is once you, you pick up the diagnosis, the treatment is very simple. You know, that is lipotomy. That means you go and uh, just take out extra blood. And uh, they, some of these patients actually do monthly blood donations. Or they actually don't donate. They just take out the blood and throw it away. Just mm. iron overload. Uh, then once it's stabilized, you can do it every few months to make sure that uh, the, there's not too much of iron accumulation in the body. So the, oh. what, the blood is tainted? What is it? So it, is the blood tainted because you said the first one is not really a donation. That means the first, they, they get so you don't the blood. You can't, donate, you can't donate this blood because it's a lot of iron inside. Oh. So oh. they just take the blood and throw it away. Don't give right. it for any donation. Yeah. So people with this condition, they will have to, the, the treatment is to donate their blood? They don't donate. They, that means, they uh, throw it away. It means they, they remove away. their blood. Yeah. They remove their blood every, depending on uh, the doctor's assess and see whether the, you know, there's too much iron inside hemoglobin going up, then they will just uh, 
uh, take uh, depending on how much you have to take out. But more time they just take out, uh, you know, just like what you donate 400 to 500 views. That's what they give, and then they monitor you closely. There's no oh. other sort of. Uh, okay. How prevalent very, is this condition yeah. in, in here I think in it's Malaysia? Not here. It's more in the Caucasians. I think mm -hmm. one in eight. I have not seen many cases here. Uh, but Why is that? Why is that? Oh, no. Why is that? Why only Caucasians? I mean, there's some pieces that are more prone in uh, you know, certain places. So I think more prone there. I'm sure we have it here. But the, the, most of the doctors you see are called hematology. So they probably will see these cases. I'm not sure how much is the prevalence in Asia. Mm. But definitely uh, it's for one in eight in Caucasians. Okay. All right, let's move on to our next article all about Botox. Now, we know Botox from the beauty industry for cosmetic treatment, but this one says, this article actually says that it's an effective treatment for certain sports injuries. Uh, so how, how can we use Botox to help reduce pain and improve functions for sport-related injuries? Yeah, I mean, this is something new because, uh, you see, Botox actually started uh, as a botulin, it's a toxin. Okay. Right? And actually, okay. Botox was used more for neurological problems. You know, we, we, people use uh, botulin for people who had, let's say, a stroke and they got spasms, spastic paralysis. That means they have a hole uh, because of the stroke. They get all spasms of their muscles mm. in whether the arms or legs. Mm. And that's where the, they were used it. Okay, that's where Botox was used or botulin was used to inject, to paralyze the nerves. So there'll be less spasm of the muscle, less pain for the patient. Uh, of course, later they realized that um, if you can paralyze the muscles, uh, the nerves, so the muscles get paralyzed. So it might help in the face, and that's where the whole cosmetic became a right. big thing. So it's never used for cosmetic. It's supposed to paralyze, you know. So and, and that's why you find that people who use regular Botox, now you find that they sort of uh, have like a stiff sort of face. Yeah. You're a bit numb looking. Uh, numb, you know, that's right. Uh, so I think the same sort of concept they're using it here to sort of reduce the spasm and the pain in the patients with the, all these arthritis conditions. Uh, but like the article says, it's not FDA approved. So it's an off-label mm. uh, you know, treatment. Uh, so I, I definitely don't know any doctors doing it here. So it's new. And of course, when you're off-label, if anything goes wrong, uh, you know, then onus is on the doctor. So interesting. You no, know, I think basically you're paralyzing that... Uh, muscles so the pain will go away yeah. uh, and uh, so maybe uh, if, if it works maybe they can look at it as uh, but again you have to look at it through a study and make sure it's safe uh, you know, in the long run before they approve uh, you know so FDA will approve or whether nation ministry will approve so wait and see but it's something interesting if there are no other options and patients are really in pain maybe then sometimes you can get permission to use as off table but if you paralyze so, the muscle, can you get the muscle mass back, you know? Yeah, that's the other thing you have to worry about because especially if your joints, you you know, if you have to reduce that pain. So I don't know how they actually look at the mechanism for the work here. You know, because they do say in the arthritis, you inject into the joints. I don't know how they, they reduce the pain. But I would actually want to paralyze the muscle because, you know, you actually lose the function of the muscle. So mm. I, I must be very careful you know, we know for neurological conditions, it is definitely uh, already approved. Of course, for cosmetic industry, it's approved. But uh, uh, in joints and muscles, I think we have to wait and see, get more information, maybe do a real studies to see whether it works or whether it's actually going to cause more harm. Mm. So this is something that's still off-label. So interesting, but wait and see. All yeah, because right. I mean, in, in sports, some of them you see nowadays, they do this ice bath thing and then also uh it's to it's to, uh, and in in some cases i remember it was uh, i think michael schumacher he had a really bad accident and then they induced coma kind of like to help the body repair itself does it work the same way in this sense uh yeah but here you keep paralyzing that muscle so it's a, a different thing uh you know so your that part might not be able to function mm. so, so i don't know how it works actually so and it's different, different of induced coma and all that's different. That you're trying to rest the body's uh, brain. Mm. So it's different from that. Shooting Botox into your muscles. That's, yeah, keep it to the lips. 
Actually, it's to the face. I don't think they use Botox for the lips. What? Well, yeah. Then, then they had this like they, they look like that all the time. I'm like, what is going on? Right? Yeah. You can't talk. No, you can't talk anymore. You paralyzed. <laughs> right, yeah. Then you have no wrinkles at all. Your face is like that. <laughs> and then, uh, right? Yeah. I'm really sad. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, let's move on to our next article um, related to COVID-19. Um, so re- new post-mortem report suggested that a substantial proportion of patients who have died of COVID-19 is due to diffuse thrombosis, um, which is pre-dom- predominantly in the vessels in the lungs. So it's like a blood clot. So how can COVID-19 actually cause blood clot? I mean, they've seen this in different viruses, but COVID seems to be quite, uh, you know, in certain group of patients, and not all the ones that are very ill, and uh, they get this uh, sort of blood clots in the vessels. And the lung is, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, you normally get a deep vein thrombosis in the legs. Yeah. They call it economic class syndrome. You get clots in the legs, yeah. and the clots can break and go right into the lung, and call what they call pulmonary embolism. Mm. So you can get a blockage of the artery in the, in the lung, and you can suddenly, you know, collapse and even die from that. Mm. Uh, so that's what they see in this COVID where they see a lot of clots in the lungs yeah. and that is a key mode and that's probably causing some of the mortality in the COVID. Uh, why that happens, they're not sure uh, whether it's a, it's a virus damages the endothelium of the vessels and that leads to clot, whether it's an inflammation that's occurring that's predisposing these uh, patients who have clots uh, and whether there are certain groups of patients who are more prone than others you know, because only 20% seem to get severe disease. So I think we're not sure, but definitely they know that uh, one of the problems is the microthrombosis that keeps on occurring. They've also got patients who have strokes, we've got patients who've got heart attacks from COVID. So this is all part of the whole thrombosis that's going on in these people, triggered off by the virus. Right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but really probably a combination of things that are happening here and, uh, uh, and to not easy to treat because they're giving anti sort of tetanus or anti coagulants or don't seem to work. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of supportive therapy, and uh, so I think uh, so all you know is that if you get a severe COVID, you are prone for thrombosis, and this can cause uh, you know, more severe disease and can lead to death. Are you able to do a CAT scan or an MRI scan to to find where these blood clots are? Yeah. And remove Normally them. we do a, 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 a CT angiogram. Uh, uh, that is uh, not in COVID because COVID is a sick patient. But let's say you get a patient who got a pulmonary embolism. We suspect it's a pulmonary because the patient has difficulty breathing, complaint of pain. We do a CT angiogram. You actually can see where the clots are. If the small clots, we give them anticoagulants. Uh, large ones actually go in and actually remove the clot. Mm. You know? Actually go in and uh, you know uh, remove the clot. Uh, do you so, take out the uh, whole the whole the vessel that the blood clot is at, or you just remove the blood clot? Remove, remove the blood clot. They actually go in and take out the clot. So, so cardiothoracic surgeons actually do that. So uh, sometimes you can go in and embolize, uh, you know, break up the clot. So different ways they do it. Uh, invasive radiologists can help. So depending on the size of the clot and how whether medical treatment or surgical treatment, uh, especially these are but these are key very. Uh, already in a serious state mm. you when know, mortality is quite high. But that's for a normal pulmonary embolism. But uh, people with COVID, I think, they're too ill for to do anything. So yeah. a lot of supporting I'm therapy. Just wa- and hope- I'm just wondering whether these patients had some pre- like uh, pre-existing condition with their lungs, maybe yeah. uh, if they had yeah, bronchitis or, or... We don't know because I think we know the risk factor. Smokers, more high risk. Uh, people with chronic diseases, you know, people with obese, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease are more at severe risk for this disease. So probably these people are already predisposed to forming clots because this, uh, you know, things like obesity, diabetes, hypertension itself is a risk factor for forming clots. Mm-hmm. So when you get a severe disease like COVID and it just makes the whole thing worse, you know, exacerbates the whole condition. So I think you're right that they are probably have a predisposing factor. They already are patients who are not very healthy immune system is weak and they already got other issues going on and COVID comes and just causes all the problems and they are more prone for clots. So it's sort of like COVID sort of this virus triggers all these other things to happen. And made it worse much faster. In a patient who's 
Uh, the patient already predisposed to these conditions. Mm. Mm. Okay. That's scary because I've got bronchitis. Oh, I had bronchitis. So I'm like, this discussion no, is very scary over, right over. now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I, if I remember correctly, there's no blood vessels inside the lungs, right? We have our bronchioles and our bron... Yeah, the, the alveolus the and... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it so, inside the lungs? The blood clot is outside yeah, the Inside, because you have vessels, you cannot. Uh, there's, of course, you got bronchioles and your alveoli, but you still need blood vessels to supply the blood to the mm. lungs and take away the blood. So they are. Okay. What I'm wondering, because at one point I remember I had to have a chest scan and I had something called what the doctor said, a, I had severe, not severe, I had scarring on my lungs. Is that the same thing? Is that clotting in my, so, in my scarring lungs? Scarring is a damage, previous damage that, yeah, so that's basically different. That's you had already had some. Uh, whatever caused the scarring, maybe an infection before, and there's some damage to the lung. So that is a, just a damaged tissue there. All right, so I'm clear. That's, that's okay, good. Yeah, just yeah, checking. Okay. Just don't get COVID. <laughs> just checking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wear a mask everywhere. All right. Uh, now, our, on to our final article. This is about how skeletal muscles. Uh, can sort of dystrophy and it's associated with statin use. So first question, I guess, doctor, is what are statins and why do people take them? I mean, statins have uh, been around for a long time now and I think it's the largest selling drug in the world. It's a blockbuster pharma drug, isn't it? <laughs> I think the companies that have made statins you know, made a lot of money. Mm. And uh, everything was cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol. So people take mm. statins to reduce cholesterol. Okay. At one time, it became such a thing that, you know, they said that almost everybody should be on a tablet of cholesterol. But uh, so I think uh, that was why statin was, you know, uh, and there are many brands out there, different types, but they all do the same thing. They reduce your cholesterol. You mm. see the bad cholesterol. Uh, but over the last few years, there's been a bit of controversy now, whether that is really do what they say they do and whether everybody should actually take cholesterol. So now the thinking has slowly changed. Now they say that if you don't have risk factors, uh, then you might not want to start with statins first. Mm. You must try your lifestyle and all those things first. Mm. So, uh, because now they find that statins do have side effects, you know. One of them is the you know, muscle pain and muscle weakness. Rarely uh, even can cause muscle damage called rhabdomyolysis. Very rare. You see, symptoms of muscle pain and uh, uh, you know muscle inflammation can be about five percent. Some people even say up to 20 30 percent. So, uh, so if you take statins and you got uh, muscle pain, the, normally when you start people on statins, the two things we check after a few weeks: the liver and their muscle enzyme. Mm -hmm. See whether there's any inflammation because it affects the liver and the muscle. And uh, if they're normal, then you know that okay, they don't have the side effect. If they are raise liver enzymes or raise muscle enzymes, then we actually advise you to stop that. That means, unless it's really, uh, well, your risk factors are very high. So what so is causing the liver to fail? It's the liver inflammation. That is one of the side effects. You know, so this all, they say rare, but you know, five to 10% is still there. So mm. primary issues, you no know, risk of even getting type B. So these are all the side effects. So for me, I think statins, depending on where you are, if you are, let's say, someone who's got hypertension, diabetes, really overweight, strong family history of heart disease, or your heart disease or stroke, then your cholesterols are high, then no choice. Like you have to mm. look at statins to bring down your cholesterol. But let's say you're a healthy person who's gone for routine checkup. You know, you don't smoke, your ideal weight, you're exercising, you're quite careful, and you find that your cholesterols are high. Now, 80% of cholesterol is formed by the liver, right? So it, difficult to bring it down by diet alone, but 60% of this cholesterol is excreted from the liver into the bile and then reabsorbed in the, you know, in the later part of the intestine, small intestine, gets reabsorbed. So that's why, you know, sometimes they talk about oats helping you to reduce cholesterol. Yeah. Mm. So what it does is it binds in the cholesterol and takes it out. Uh, and there are medications and uh, that actually can do that. So I would still try exercise and diet first, then try the cholesterol binders which are very safe medications that will help to reduce the cholesterol. And after three months of that, if you still cannot bring down your cholesterol, then 
you can look at other drugs that are non statins mm. so they can also help the cholesterol and i have used statins as a last resort yeah because uh, once you take now, statin you can't stop right it's like you have to take it long term already the thing is, if you stop your cassette, your cholesterol will go up so i but i find patients who have uh, taken statins to bring down their cholesterol and change their lifestyle, lose weight, you know, do all the right things that they're supposed to do. And slowly we'll be able to take off their, their medication. So it's not, you know, even diabetes, hypertension, now we don't believe anything is lifelong. You can bring down your uh, risk factors, bring down your, you know, change your lifestyle. People have gone off the drugs. I got patients who have lost 20 kg, no more diabetes, no more hypertension, high cholesterol has gone away. You know, so, so it's again your lifestyle. So I always want people to try that first, uh, mm. because statins, though have been around for many years, you know they have their own side effects and long-term effects nobody knows. Mm. So uh, no choice, high risk factors, yes. Low risk factors, try other methods other before methods. you go on the drugs. But what kind of side effects does it cause to the muscles? Like what kind of problems will it cause to the muscle? Inflammation, inflammation to the muscles. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Your muscles, uh, you can see your muscle enzymes will go up. So you get a lot of pain, a lot of aches. You know, some people actually, they, they can't play golf anymore, for example, you know, because there's weakness of their muscles, inflammation of the muscles. Suddenly they've, you know, imagine all the time you're getting aches and pains all over. Mm. You, know, you know, life is not so nice anymore. Mm-hmm. You, know, you feel like you're suddenly old. You know, so... All right. Uh, because I know some people who feel worse after having to take statins because they needed to yeah. take their cholesterol level down. They're weaker, they're slower. Yeah, all that do happen. And uh, you know, people having uh, issues with their memory, memory gets more fuzzy. So if they have this type of side effects, I would actually want them to try alternative before they you know, take the statins. Because I have, uh, have an auntie who's been taking statin long term and suddenly she has like muscle dystrophy in the thighs, like she can't really walk properly anymore. Could it be caused by the statin? No, no, because we, uh, when I did, I checked the muscle at time because if she had uh, inflammation of the muscles and it, she didn't know about it uh-huh. and uh, you know, they, some aches and pains, they don't bother and slowly the inflammation will lead to muscle damage and then she could have that. Because of, uh, I don't know whether it's because that you know it's something else, mm. right? So, mm. uh, but it could have been you know. So, if, um, the moral of the story take, is just try not to have to take statin though. Try other ways, right? Uh, so talk to your doctor before you jump into anything. If right. you're not risk factor, sometimes you got no choice, you know. But a lot of time people take a drug and then after they don't bother. They go mm. back to the pharmacy and they keep on taking the same drug, mm. uh, you know. So that's why it's important that you actually every few months, if you're on medication, see your doctor, get some blood done every few months to make sure that you're on the right track. So normally people on statins, I'll check the liver, the kidney, muscle enzymes, and also of course check their cholesterol to see whether it's in the right levels. <laughs> <laughs>